dropping in. I'm Miss Danielle, an educational enthusiast. That means I like to learn about everything. And you caught me at the perfect time. I'm waiting on a phone call from my friend Daniel James, a fellow explorer who's out and about in our community today. That's him now. Let's see what he's gotten himself into. Hi, Daniel. How are you? Hi, Explorers. Thanks for tagging along today. I'm Daniel James, and I'm here in the Science Museum in the center in the square in Roanoke, Virginia. And today, I'm very excited to learn about animal adaptations, but I can't do it alone. So I brought my friend here, Kat Huffman, and she's going to talk to us today about those adaptations. Hi, Daniel. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, I am the Director of Living Collections here at the Science Museum of Western Virginia. Um, I get to work with all of the animals that live here and call this place home, which is really exciting and a great job. And I'm excited to share with you a little bit more about the animal adaptations that we're going to cover today. And what animal are we looking at today? Yeah, we are looking at Franklin. Franklin is an eastern box turtle. Super cute, and he's one of our most social animals. He loves to be the center of attention. So Kat, what are adaptations? Adaptations are changes in animals that happen over a long period of time and they help the animals survive. And then what kind of adaptation, what's an example of one that Franklin here has gone through? Turtles are super special. They have these awesome shells made out of bone that protect their body. Uh, Franklin as an Eastern box turtle has something special though. So he has um, his bottom shell. They do actually have a top shell and a bottom shell. His bottom shell, his plastron, is actually a divided plastron. So if you see, there's a little line right here, and that's a top piece and a bottom piece to his shell. So um, shells, if you think about it, what are shells used for to help the animal do? Protect. Defense, Protect, right? yeah. So if an animal gets scared, if a turtle gets scared, it will actually pull its arms and legs and head into its shell in order to kind of protect itself behind this shield almost. But what box turtles can do, which is something very special, is they can actually close up the gaps in the top and the back because of that movable plaster on that two-piece um, bottom shell. So I actually have here a shell, yep, a shell of a different species of turtle just to show you how it's different. So these top and bottom shells, see how the bottom shell here is just one big piece? Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're actually connected. Uh, the top and bottom shell are connected by a little piece called a bridge. Um, and what this means is that when this turtle pulls itself into its shell, there will still always be this gap in the front and in the back. But Franklin, when he gets scared, can actually use his muscles to close, almost like closing a garage door, to make this yeah. almost disappear where there's no space. And actually, it's so tight that not even an ant could crawl huh? into his shell. So does he need more defense because he's smaller? Or why does he have the door and this one doesn't? Yeah, it's actually one of the strange adaptations that just has developed with his specific type of turtle. Um, one of the things that we might think it is is that he spends a lot more time on land than other turtles. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that actually brings us into one of our second adaptations. What's another talk one? About. So um, he has these really, really awesome claws on his hands. Um, he has stockier arms than most turtles might have, and he actually does have this more domed or box-like um, shell. So most turtles, they are actually more streamlined, they have webbed feet typically, um, and that helps them swim around in water. Um, he is more adapt adapted um, to being more on land, a more terrestrial animal, and so he will has those claws that help him dig around in dirt, um, and he has that nice domed shell that um, he can pull himself into and close it up. Um, so he's more adapted to living on land than those turtles. Yeah, and they're not sharp at all. They actually feel kind of nice. Yeah, but <laughs> we it, actually do trim his nails you do have at the to Science trim them. Museum, yeah. Okay, but otherwise <laughs> but, they would just be the wear and tear and mm -hmm. it would trim that down. And then his nails, is that the same material as his yes. shell? Yeah, that keratin, so. Um, the, it also, his shell has bone, but it also does have that layer of the same stuff as your fingernails on top, which is keratin. I have another shell here. This one is from another box turtle. Um, so you can see it's more domed and it doesn't have that bottom shell connected, right? Um, so this top layer, you can see, and this one comes off, his wouldn't come off. <laughs> wow. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but these are called scoots. They are made out of the same thing as your fingernail or okay. your hair, keratin. <laughs> Um, and it is another adaptation because it helps him camouflage. So if you imagine what color is bone normally? 
white. -ish. White, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, he lives in a forest, and so if he's going across in a forest and he's bright white, you'd think you'd be able to see him pretty well? Oh, no. Not if he's bright white? Oh, no. If he was, I mean, sometimes. Yeah. No, I don't think so. <laughs> they are hard to spot, especially because they're so small, but... Um, bright white shells would be easier to spot. Um, so he wants that extra layer on top that gives him these beautiful colors that help him blend in and camouflage. I just forgot to, I don't have good vision, so I haven't adapted to finding turtles. <laughs> so that's part of the problem though. So what does his natural environment look like? Yeah, so he lives in forested areas, um, usually near water sources like rivers or lakes, but um, he definitely loves to be on a forest floor. So if you were living in Virginia in these parts and you were to go on a hike or to go in your backyard, you might actually find a box turtle because he just loves to be out in the woods. Um, that is why he has those colors that look like dirt and dead leaves because he wants to blend in with the forest floor. Um, yeah, and he loves to be around where there's water, rocks, bugs, um, things to eat. He eats a lot of plants too, a lot more than other turtles might, species might, but. So yeah. did he, is he originally, is his natural environment around Roanoke? Um, yes, yeah, he can naturally be find, found in Roanoke. Um, he can also be found all over the state and all over states all along the East Coast. Does he have this red color because of the fall leaves? <laughs> that is a great, uh, great observation there, but uh, we actually don't know why he has the, the bright colors on his skin. He actually is a lot more red than most box turtles you would find. Most Eastern box turtles are more yellow, but you can actually find their coloration varies a lot based on um, just different ones that are born. Um, he is a lot more red than you'd mostly find. <laughs> yeah, so that's something explorers and I could look into mm -hmm. and figure out a little bit more about. A great research opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. And then are there other animals here too or other examples? How have you adapted to working here? Yeah, <laughs> I have adapted to working here by uh, I have to wear clothes that I get dirty sometimes because I deal with a lot of animals and cleaning up after them. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. Well, yeah, um, Franklin here seems very friendly though too and he seems to want to be on the move all the oh, time. Oh yeah, he's very friendly and very active. <laughs> Yeah. He loves to be around people. He actually is one of our best ambassador animals to go out and teach public and people who visit the museum about animals uh, because he's super duper friendly. <laughs> yeah, look at him. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, very cool. Well, uh, and, and then are there other animals too we can go look at? Yes, there are. Um, I bet I have other friends that can help you out with that, but there are lots of animals that live here at the center in the square that have adaptations to show off. Awesome. Well, for right now, should we put him back in? Yeah, let's put him back in his tank. Awesome. Thank you so much, of Matt. Course. I appreciate you sharing this with yeah. us. Yeah. Thanks for coming to meet Franklin. Hey, DJ. Hi. Hey, I'm John. How Hi, are you? John. Good. How are you doing? Good. Good to see you. Uh, good. Um, yeah. Can you tell me something about, do you know about these fish? I, I, knew, I do happen to know a little bit about these fish. You are looking at a living reef aquarium that very closely mimics a coral reef in the wild. That's awesome. So I was trying to look in and see. I'm here today because I'm trying to look for animal adaptations and learn a little bit more about them. Yeah. Can you tell me about, first off, what all is in here? So what we have in here are living corals and the fish that would normally live in their environment in the wild. And there are many, many corals in this tank. Uh, corals, by the way, are animals, not plants. Okay. But they kind of look like plants, and so it's it's they have to be in a certain place at a certain time. How do you tell them apart from the rocks? Are the rocks corals too, or is that just separate? It's these plants. Well, that's an interesting question. The rocks were corals millions of years ago, and as the corals died off and left their bony skeletons behind, that's they created these rocks. That's amazing. Yeah. So what are the like? Are there different types, and do they get along well together too? Have they adapted to live together? So corals need a certain amount of light and a certain amount of water flow and each coral needs its perfect place on the reef. And when it finds that perfect place, it has developed ways to defend itself against maybe another coral that also wants that space or a fish that might want that space. So some corals might sting another coral if they come too close or they might release just a little bit of toxin that says to the other coral, you don't want to be in this place, this is my place on the reef and the coral has to have that perfect place with light and water flow and interaction with its environment. Now some of these I see and I kind of recognize because they look like anemones though, but then some of these don't look like that at all. Are they, right. Have they adapted in different ways? They have adapted in different ways and uh, some of these corals, like this one you see over here, can live much closer to the surface. If the tide goes out, it might be able to live in the air for just a little while till the tide comes back in. 
whereas some of these other corals couldn't survive that. So these corals that have sort of fleshy tentacles, they don't do so well if they're not in the water. They need that water to support them, right? But this coral over here is more of a stony structure, and that's a better example of the type of coral that when it dies, leaves that bony skeleton behind, or maybe even when a portion of it dies, leaves that skeleton behind, and that becomes what builds up our reefs that protect uh, the, the uh, shoreline. Now, any of these animals, and also the, the corals themselves too, can I find them in like the Roanoke River or anything nearby? No, you're not gonna find them locally. These fish live in the ocean, and particularly most of these fish live in the Pacific Ocean, so think of India, Australia, areas like that. That's where you would find most of these fish and corals. Okay, and is that where these ones actually came from? These fish actually did come from there, yes. Most of these fish were caught in the wild and uh, were then transported and very carefully and lovingly and then brought here uh, from a distributor in Florida. And then what's another example? Because now we know a little bit about the coral though too, but what's another animal adaptation that maybe one of the fish has gone through? All right, so you look at the fish swimming around this tank. It's beautiful, it's peaceful, it's soothing. Uh, and But the fish all know that many of the other fish have adapted to protect themselves. So the easiest one to look at is the yellow tang. Mm -hmm. And the yellow tang has a bright white barb right at the beginning of its tail. Yeah. But some people refer to those fish as surgeon fish because that white barb is actually like a scalpel. And if another fish starts to threaten it, you'll see him back up with his tail. And that, that, that's saying to that other fish, I'm gonna slash you with the scalpel if you don't give me my space. A scalpel, like, just it's sharp kind of? It's is this, like, sharp as a knife, yes, yes. And people who keep aquariums know not to threaten that fish because they can actually even cut a human hand. Oh. So they don't do it maliciously. It's not like they're running around saying, oh, I'm gonna eat you or whatever. It's only a defense mechanism. Yeah. So is that, how long does it take for a fish like that to adapt that way too? They, they know it as soon as they're born. Yeah. They just, it's just something that fish just know. And so as long as everybody knows their place on the reef, everybody gets along just fine. And there's no place on earth where there is so much demand for that space on the reef. So everything has evolved to the point where um, it knows its spot in a living reef and that's the way they live their life. So I just wanted to check one more thing though too. Did, did you caught all these fish and brought them here? I did not. You didn't. Okay. I would love to have that job. I was going to ask if we could it. go. I didn't do it. But it's so beautiful in the wild. Awesome. Yeah. Well, that's really fascinating. Yeah. I think that really helps the explorers here too. But thank you, John. I really appreciate you explaining sure. all this. That's why we have this tank at Center in the Square, because not everybody gets to go to Australia and go on the reef and see the fish. We get to learn about it right here at Center in the Square. That's awesome. Well, explorers, I hope you had fun today. I know I did. I mean, we went everywhere from the mountains all the way down to the seafloor, got to learn about different adaptations that animals take. And now everywhere I look, I feel like I'm learning that there's another adaptation somewhere. It's just finding out which. But this time I didn't even need a snorkel. I didn't honestly even need my boots to wear these because I feel like there's just a little overkill. Ha! Huh. Bye, Daniel. I'll talk to you next time. That's all for today's Get Schooled. I hope you had a great time exploring with Daniel and I. And until next time, keep exploring and stay curious. Bye.